here on applying the new ISO 10993 standards, a risk-based approach to biocompatibility. My name is Thor Rollins. I'm the Director of Toxicology and ENL Consulting here at Nelson Laboratories. Um, I have been working in at Nelson Laboratories for 17 years. That whole time I've been working in biocompatibility. And I also am an active member on the TC194 Technical Committee Group that is in charge for writing these ISO 10993 standards. So today, we're going to go through the brand new 10.93-1 that came out in August of last year um, and the changes that they includes for biocompatibility. We're also going to look at how that kind of correlates with the new guidance that, well, relatively new guidance that the FDA came out with in 2016 and see how we can use both of these documents to evaluate biocompatibility. So these are the two documents that I, I mentioned earlier. The first one, that 10993 suite, is the Bible, uh, biocompatibility. Most people, when they think of biocompatibility, that's the first place they go to. The suite contains soon to be 23 different parts. Um, and the reason why it's soon is as the we are eventually going to split ISO 10993-10, which is right now sensitization and irritation. Uh, the sensitization is going to stay with dash 10 but um, irritation is going to move to dash 23. And in that movement, we're going to put a new emphasis on some in vitro alternatives to that irritation test. Um, and there will be further webinars going over the, the impact of, of the in vitro alternative irritation test uh, that we can uh, reference later. The other document on this slide is the US FDA guidance document. Um, that document was released in 2016. And it's basically how the FDA interprets 10993. So it's, it's, the 10993 is kind of the, the law, uh, especially in Europe. If you're dealing with a notified body, they follow what 10993 says as, as a law. They follow it directly. Where the FDA uses it more as guidelines, where they will uh, kind of add their own interpretation onto that 10993. A lot of people have asked me recently how they correlate with one another, because like I mentioned before, the 10993-1 came out in August of last year. And if you, you can see in this slide, the FDA guidance document came out in June of 2016. So there's a, a pretty good gap in between the two. And so does the 10993 make the FDA guidance document absolute, absolute? And the the answer to that is no. And the, the reason why is because the same FDA people who were in charge of, of penning or writing the guidance document are actually working on the 10993 series with, with us. So those individuals, and, and it takes a while to write a 10993 document. So we've been working on the, the concepts in that 10993-1 for years. Uh, so far, so long that uh, the FDA was able to incorporate all those concepts quicker in their guidance document. Um, in fact, some of the individuals that wrote the guidance document also helped write dash one. So uh, it, they really correlate quite well, actually. And we're going to kind of show that here in the next few slides. So the whole point of this, though, is that, man, in the last five years, I would say Biocomp has really just changed and, and is constantly changing. And that's good. And that's, that's really good. And the reason why it's good is because, uh, honestly, we've been kind of slow to change our biocomp evaluations up to that point. Uh, in my 17 years, the first 12, 10 to 12 years, it was really kind of consistent how we did biocomp. And it was, you know, pretty outdated, to be completely honest. So there's a lot of change that, need to hap that needs to happen to get um, the biocomp to a, to a part where we we are sufficient to the times. And they, the reason why is because, you know, when Biocomp was st first evaluated or put into the evaluation for medical devices, a lot of the medical devices were pretty inert materials used for years, and it really didn't have a lot of risk to them, right? And, and honestly, a lot of those are used today. But you're looking at a lot of like metals and titanium and stainless steel and, and things like that. But if you start looking at some of the new materials that are being used in the industry today, you start looking at things like nanomaterials or biodegradable devices or, or things like that, that, that may be a little bit more difficult to evaluate than your standard stainless steel, or not maybe, are more difficult to evaluate than your standard stainless steel. So um, the, the old approach really wasn't sufficient, and so there needs to be a change. 
Um, so with that, we also, besides changing the scientific approach to biocompatibility, we have a lot of regulatory changes happening at this moment. So we talked about the FDA guidance document, and we talked about the new ISO 10993 uh, changes that are happened and are happening right now. For example, Dash 18 should be coming out any, any day now as a draft, a uh, uh, public draft for uh, review. And then Dash 17, which is toxicological evaluation, is also uh, close to being summed up. So we're starting to see some of these standards come out, a uh, new impact. Uh, we're working on Dash 12, which is sample preparation. We're working on Dash 5, which is cytotoxicity. So there's a lot of, of work happening at that ISO um, level. But we also have big changes in Europe. I mean, very impactful changes, and we'll talk a little bit about those uh, uh, today. But um, those changes have to do with the medical device regulations, the new MDR that came, is, uh, came out and is being effective uh, in 2020 and a little bit on beyond. And the big impact with, those, uh, with the MDR is that um, there's no grandfathering of those medical devices, which means that every single device that is currently on the market or want to be on the market in the EU have to go back through their evaluation with the notified body. And that means they have to go back through the new evaluation for biocompatibility. So if that device has been on the market for 20 years, that may sound perfect because it may sound like, why do I need to evaluate for biocomp because it's been in the in clinical use for 20 years over in Europe and there's been no recorded issues. And so why do I have to worry about it? Well, the reason why is because unless you have specific alerts for those biological endpoints in your clinical uh, observations, so like the best example is the ocular contacting devices have specific alerts for irritation when you're looking for, uh, you know, ocular Im impacts, then, you know, maybe you can use those as for irritation evaluations, but not many devices have specific alerts for like sensitization or, or uh, others. And then you start looking at other long-term possible problems like cancer or, or subchronic toxicity, and they may not correlate well with the device. Uh, so we may not be able to actually tie the ends together very well. So to be completely honest, most medical devices aren't going to be able to use their clinical hu uh, history use as a way to justify biocompatibility. They're going to have to go back through the most current standard. And some of these devices have been on the market for 20, 30 years, and that means their biocompatibility, when if it was performed at all, might have just been a cytotox or something very, very simple. And so uh, these devices now have to have a gap analysis to see how much it's going to take to get them up to the most current regulations. Um, some of our companies are going through this right now, are actually determining if, if certain devices are worth keeping on the market in the EU, or is it better just to retire those, those devices because it's not worth the, the extra cost and time to get them uh, through a, a new, uh, to get a new CE mark. So we have all this changing in, changing in, in uh, biocompatibility science, and then we also have a lot of changes in the regulations, and all of this is kind of hitting at the same time, and that's really unique and, and disruptive in the industry uh, because we have new regulations and new uh, standards. It, it kind of is a worst case scenario. Um, these are the links for those three documents in case, uh, or some of those documents in case you guys want to take a better look at it. So this comes, this whole gap analysis with the MDRs and, and new standards being evaluated with the risk-based approach, um, it, it reminds me of a story. Uh, and I, and for those of you that may have attended some of my live uh, sessions, I talk about this sometimes, but um, so I, I, we currently are based here in Salt Lake City, Utah, and uh, Salt Lake City, Utah is one of the most uh, beautiful places in the world for outdoor activities. Uh, I would put it up against anywhere. It's, it's a wonderful place if you like outdoors. Um, I had moved here from another part of the United States that wasn't quite as, as uh, appealing to be outdoors as it is here. So when I first moved to Utah, um, and, you know, I decided that I wanted to give backpacking a try. I wanted to... Uh, be able to go backpacking up in these beautiful mountains in national forests. So the first thing I did was I attended, uh, you know, an outdoor store, and I pretty much just picked every single thing that I thought I might need for a backpacking trip. Never having really been on one before, I didn't know what really was going to be needed. So, you know, I picked up my tent and my sleeping bag and uh, food, and, and then I started picking up things like bear spray and cougar repellent and GPSs and all these these things that uh, I thought I might need because I'm in Utah and I might see a bear and I want to make sure I have a bear spray. Um, and so by the end of this shopping day, my wallet was a lot lighter, but my backpack started looking a lot like this. 
Um, and when I went to go backpacking, I threw literally everything I could fit into my backpack and started going down the trail. Now, it became very obvious quickly that um, it, this backpacking trip was going to be a lot more burdensome than I than I thought it was going to be. And the, the, the main reason was because my backpack was just way too full. Uh, it was too heavy, um, and it had everything I needed. But um, by the time I got to my camping spot, I, I would not have said that backpacking was a fun thing to do. Did not really understand why everybody thought so highly of this of this activity. Um, but luckily, since then, <laughs> I have got more experience, and I've understood that sometimes when you run or do a backpacking trail, you may not need certain um, things to put in your backpack to weigh you down. And it really depends on the the trail itself, how steep it is, how long it is, where it is, uh, you know, how how uh, defined it is, how wild it is. All these kind of uh, different scenarios determines what you need to put in your backpack. And over backpacking is just as bad as under backpacking. So this correlates to me really well to the new approach for biocompatibility because it's a risk-based approach. And the first thing you have to know is how bad is your trail? Um, you know, how hard is your trail? How risky is your device? And then based on that, that helps you know what to put in your backpack. And yes, it's possible that you can over back. Um, you can put full-blown extractable leecher bolts. You can go through all the testing. Um, you can do in-depth material assessments and you can do all of these wonderful things and they are wonderful to evaluate safety. But if your device is a low risk device, you're probably stuffing your backpack way too full. And so the key is to have experience or work with people who have experience enough to know what is needed based off the risk of your device or how much to pack in your backpack based on the, the, the effort required for that trail. So keep in mind when we go through this, keep in mind that exactly what you need to put in your backpack based off of your device. And this is kind of where we start. So the funny thing is when I first started in this industry, I would get these phone or these phone calls and, and questions all the time or statements where, oh, I don't like biocomp. It's too expensive and too long. And my device has been on the market already for years in Europe. Why am I doing so much testing? Or um, I only use biodegradable or biocompatible materials or materials according to ASTM standards. Uh, we did a lot of testing in R&D phases um, with, with animals or my device is only, you know, very short contact with the body. So, you know, in the past, we used to just kind of say, yes, we know that's true, but you're going to have to just do the testing anyway. The benefit of a risk-based approach is that these questions become more relevant uh, because they help evaluate the risk of the medical device. So um, the same questions that we've had for, for years that maybe weren't as impactful before now become impactful. So, yes, ask these questions. In fact, that's the whole point of this is to understand the risk of your medical device to help you pack appropriately. So that past approach that we talked about where you would just check box or just do the testing, um, you know, why are we going away from that? Uh, why are, why are company or why are us experts that are writing these standards trying to get away from a, a check box mentality? Um, so the, the, the way I like to recommend this is, or represent this is, is my car example. So um, the car the, on the left is my 1967 Mustang. It was my first car I ever, ever had. And I absolutely loved that car. Um, still love it, don't have it today, but I still love those cars. But when you start looking at 60 style muscle cars, especially, um, you start realizing some of the, the lovable problems that they had. For example, the gas mileage wasn't great. So, uh, in fact, I could probably watch my gas style move um, while I was uh, riding pretty aggressively. Um, also, it didn't have power steering, didn't have power brakes, um, pretty much didn't have power anything. Um, so steering or, or stopping became difficult to challenging sometimes. Um, and even though it's still a car and still gets to where you want to go, the efficiencies and, and reliability and, and safety of that car probably isn't where it needs to be compared to cars today. Uh, cars today are much more efficient, much more reliable, have a lot more safety features, um, and are just much more easy to, to navigate. Well, once again, the testing that we traditionally do in biocomp, like the sensations and the irritations of the world, they were test designed back at the same time we have this car designed. So they're basically the same technology of these cars in biocompatibility tests. 
And I can't think of most, a lot of places in the world right now that we are still really happy with the technology of 50, 60 years ago. Phones, cars, that's just named a few. So why are we still using these animal tests that uh, help places in, in our evaluation, but are not as reliable as we originally thought? The more and more we evaluate the results of these studies compared to better science, we start to understand that these tests probably aren't as predictive and reliable as we were hoping. So it's time to jump into a new car. And the main problem, so this is the past approach, right? And honestly, the, the benefit of the past approach was it was easy. Um, I completely, to be completely frank, I taught my 12-year-old daughter how to do this evaluation. Um, and it's that easy that my 12-year-old daughter could do it. Because all you have to do is know how the device is used in the body, how long a duration it's in contact with the body, and then it tells you what testing to do. And this chest, this chart is out of the old G95 table from biocompatibility approach for the FDA. And the only trick to really to that was the duration because uh, a device may have been used in the body for like 10 minutes, but used in the body for 10 minutes for every day for the rest of their life. So that repeated exposure may increase the actual duration exposure of that device. So you may be tempted to do limited, but it's in reality prolonged or permanent depending on the length of cumulative time. So in reality, this is a pretty easy kind of activity to do. It was a checkbox approach and engineers and everybody loved it because it was a cinch. The problem is that we had we did not have to really know anything about the safety of the materials that we're putting in or about the testing themselves. Um, and we saw this. So we had companies that would go to local stores and buy materials off the shelf of those stores and put in their medical device. And as long as it didn't react in some guinea pig, um, then they felt like it was safe to put in the body. And uh, they also didn't even really have to know what that test looks for as long as it passed, right? Or what sensitization was. So the, the past approach had a lot of faults when you start looking at the, the actual risk of these medical devices because you didn't have to know the risks. All you had to do was this checkbox. And yes, I've had people say, well, that chart is pretty much a risk assessment. And it's a first step to understand. So the, that helps you understand maybe the biological endpoints that have to be considered. But it's not a risk assessment because, once again, you, have, you don't have to know anything about the materials or processing uh, to be able to do this chart. So because of that, the new 1093-1 takes this completely out of the picture. It moves this table to an informative annex, and then we'll show you how else it, it kind of uh, fights the checkbox approach in a minute. So 1093 is all about risk, and risk assessment becomes a huge risk assessment and risk management becomes a huge part of what 1093 spells out. So um, it's in, imperative to understand what risk assessing is. And if you thought that the FDA wasn't doing this either, I took this paragraph right out of the new guidance document, and it's my favorite paragraph to help sum up what a biocompatibility process should be. Because if you read through it, it says that the risk management process, the whole biocompatibility process, begins with an assessment of the device. And that assessment should include the material components, so you need to assess the materials, the manufacturing processes, so what you're doing to those materials during the process, any residuals that could happen, and then ultimately the clinical use of the device. So we just talked about the, the biological endpoints based on its use. So those are the three things that should go into your risk assessment, materials, processing, and how the device is used. Once you consider this information from and look at the risks from a biological perspective and you identify those risks, then you come up with a plan. A plan should be developed. We call that a biological evaluation plan. That plan then spells out how you're going to mitigate those risks that you have. And this is the key part of this FDA guidance document. These risks can be evaluated by testing or other appropriate ways. So those other appropriate ways can be lots of different things. It can be a look at material assessments. It can be look at chemistry. It can be looked at uh, material chemistry. It can be looked at a lot of different things that we can do to try to evaluate these endpoints. And we shouldn't just automatically go to the test. Uh, in fact, most of the times, we don't want to just jump right to the test itself. So if we're talking so much about risk, what is risk? Um, and I, I stole this slide from a friend of mine with permission, um, uh, Dr. Ed Rivardi. Uh, this is risk, right? It's the, out of 14971, risk is the combination of probability of occurrence of harm and the severity of the harm. And that's what we do with these documents. We look at what could the harm be 
like what actually could happen and what's the severity of that and how often could it occur. And that helps us understand it. So this little mouse is looking at the harm of the trap and could the helmet help mitigate that risk? In a nutshell, that's what we do with biocompatibility. So if we break this down into a three-step approach, this is what it is. This is pretty much what the FDA spells out in their guidance document and also what 1093 has us do, which is first we develop that BEP, that biological evaluation plan. And this BEP is your initial risk. Like we talked about, you look at your materials and your processes, how it's used, you look at any failure investigate or failure possibilities, anything like that, you develop your risk. And then you develop a plan to mitigate those risks. And all of that is spelled out in your biological evaluation plan. Our recommendation, and I cannot stress this enough, especially if you have something that maybe is not a typical uh, risk assessment plan, is then you stop and you deliver that plan to your regulatory body for um, feedback. And yes, you can do this both in Europe and with the FDA. So the FDA is a pre-sub concept where you um, communicate with them officially, it's free, and it's great because you get feedback on that plan. And you get feedback before you start testing and risk assessing. We can do the exact same thing with notified bodies. So we have a, a relationship with Tooth Sued where you can either do this directly with them or if you're not a, uh, you know, a company of theirs, then we can represent you in, in your behalf. But basically all you're doing is getting feedback to see if your plan meets their interpretation of 10993. So it's a great way to be able to submit that plan to a, a regulatory body and get their feedback before you start the more expensive and, and longer testing. So that's your first step. Then you actually do what your plan tells you to do, uh, which is whatever testing and risk assessments it lays out. And then ultimately you deliver what's called a biological evaluation report. And we'll talk what that is here at the end of my presentation. But basically this is a summation of your risk and then um, uh, the re results of your evaluations and tests and then ultimately a declaration of safety. So this is your, your three-step process that you go through for biocompatibility. Now, this isn't new. I, I know we keep on talking about the new 1093 and new everything like that, but we really tried to have this in the old version. So this, this flow chart was actually out of the chart, or the 2000, 2009 version of 1093-1. And if you walk through this flow chart, um, it, Actually, it's a risk assessment. Uh, you talk about materials, you talk about processing, and, and you either, you're either even allowed to get out of this whole process without testing if you can answer these questions successfully. Now, you do have to have, depending on the risk of the device, a lot of good material information and process information to do that. But we have had success where we, we've done actually permitted implants uh, where we've, we've only done in vitro tests and no animal tests or things along those lines or compared against predicates. So these type of approaches work um, if you have the appropriate information. And because we tried to do this before and it just wasn't really working, we, we actually took it to the nth degree at the new 10.93-1. So let's take a look. So this is uh, the chart out of the FDA guidance document. And so this is the first one, the 2016 uh, document that's released. And there's some changes in this one. So the, the FDA added some material made of pyrogen on that chart. It was always there. We always had to do it, but it was just included in acute systemic toxicity. Now the FDA separated it out into its own, and they also added reproductive and, and developmental and degradation endpoints. Um, and those are just there if, you're, if you have a risk of those things happening. Once again, it's a risk-based approach. They also added a lot of circles and, and that wasn't included in the original 2009 ISO 10093 uh, document. But the, for me, the, one of the biggest benefits to that, the reason why they added the circles, like technically the, the G95 had circles already, but nobody really did them. And, and the FDA in this document pretty much told everybody that the X's and circles were the same. And the reason why you consider the X and circles the same is because it's not a checkbox. Um, you assess those endpoints. And so it doesn't mean that if you have a circle or even an X in, in one of those categories that you have to do that test. That's just an endpoint that now you have to assess. And that assessment could be that you have the materials needed to, to justify it or the information needed to justify it. So if you look at the key down below, the X's and O's are, the, one, the X's are what 1093-1, 2009 recommended endpoints for consideration, and the, and the circles are what FDA considers as recommended endpoints for consideration. So they're the same, but they're not tests. So that's the FDA's version of the chart. And this is the, the 2018 1093-1, uh, a, 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 like a subset of what the chart looks like. 
And right away, there's some big changes. Uh, the first thing that you may not notice is if you go back to where the X's and circles are, um, in the past, that X's were what 1093 recommended, and then circles were additional. Well, now the ISO actually recommends all of those. So now there's no more X's and O's. It's just all, everything is what is recommended to evaluate uh, that the FDA has in their guidance document. So that's one change. We added more evaluation endpoints. The second big change, though, is we added a column. And that column is physical and or chemical information. And it's very important that you understand that we say physical and or chemical information because they're different. There's a difference between physical information and chemical information. And there are times when you just need physical information. If your device is really low risk uh, or certain aspects of the device may just need physical and not chemical. But in, in certain applications, chemistry is going to be needed to fill in the gaps. Physical information is probably not going to be sufficient to, to justify, and you'll need to have some chemical information. So we put that in purpose because we want to distinguish between those two. We also made this the only column that it has an X. So this is the only column that's actually required. You, regardless of contact duration, regardless of risk, if your device directly or indirectly contacts the body, you need to perform a physical and chemical evaluation on that material. Um, that's absolute. Based off of that physical and or chemical information, then you evaluate, that's the third change, which is those E's, you evaluate those endpoints. Once again, you do not test, and, and that's why we put ease in here, and we moved it to an informative, is because based on your information, you evaluate to see if those tests are needed. And then you justify uh, why or why you did not do the test. So right now with the FDA, they don't really, if you do the test, they're not really looking for an evaluation of why you, you did the test. Uh, if you did it, that, that's fine. For, for your notified body, because they're following this as a law, you actually have to justify why you decided to do that test. So you'd have to say that my first risk assessment, did I don't have enough information about the materials or my processing I'm not conf confident with, so we're going to do this test because I feel there's a gap. So yeah, we actually see that and, and from notified bodies with people who just checkbox their testing, they actually have to go back and evaluate it after they've already tested it, which is kind of putting the cart in for the horse. So this is the new uh, chart for the 1093-1. So since material evaluation is becoming so important, let's just walk through a couple of some, some thoughts on a material evaluation. So we, we write BEPs for companies, and when we do so, this is the one we spend like a lot of time on because based on the materials, you, you, material information and process information you can gather, then it helps you evaluate what endpoints you have to assess with, your, uh, with testing. So what are the pro challenges to these material evaluations? Well, first, you have to understand your product. And that's almost like a duh, but in reality, because this really hasn't been something that companies have done a lot with, um, they, they don't have experience with, they, they have great experience with evaluating materials for like uh, strength or rigidity or other functionality kind of aspects. But when it comes to toxicology, they, they just kind of accept a medical grade or USB class six. I, if I could teach you one thing in this webinar is that if someone tells you something's a medical grade or a USB class six, you please, especially medical grade, please ask them what they're doing uh, and compare it to the biological endpoints that you have to do because medical grade doesn't really mean anything. Um, and so they may have just done a subtle talks or maybe they're just making it on its own uh, design or uh, identified line for medical grade and it's the same material and process as something put into a car right so i actually dig to find out what medical grade means understand usp class 6 it's it's not the same test as iso 1093 you need to understand what's different about those two because ultimately this goes into your risk assessment is, is understand your materials and processes from a toxicological and biocompatibility endpoint you also have to understand how that may change through the life cycle of the material as it degrades or maybe it gets better when it sits on the shelf. Those are things you have to understand. Uh, that goes in with the with leachability substance within your product. And then, um, then that helps you evaluate the total risk of your medical device with materials and processes. There are some things also that can impact that you maybe not understand when you just look at the materials. Uh, for example, material versus material interactions. Uh, can, you, can you try to estimate those with maybe combination products? Do you have new materials in the device that, with a, just, that may be surrounded by a bunch of older materials, and how does that impact your risk? 
Um, geometry can play a route. In fact, two main ways it plays a route. The first one is with certain tests. Um, for example, implantation and hemocompatibility are the two main tests where geometry actually can make a big impact, even compared to leachability. Um, but the other one that can kind of play an impact is when you have a coded device and you change the, the uh, geometry of the, the device and make the coding thicknesses different. Well, that could change the leachability of that coding. So geometry can play a role, not always, but can. And then obviously patient contact. And that last thing we talked about, which is failure modes. So this goes into your risk assessment. And if your device fails, if something happens to your device, will parts of your device be exposed to the body that were not intended to be uh, under normal clinical conditions? A good example for this one that I use all the time is a balloon. So balloons get put into the body, they get ex the, you know blown up either by air or liquid. And what happens if that balloon pops inside the body? Well, now the liquid that is being used to expand the balloon uh, goes throughout the body, and, and everything that liquid touched in the fluid path now is leaching in into the body. So we have to evaluate to see if that balloon pops, are there parts of the materials that are contacting the fluid that now have risk to the body where a normal used balloon wouldn't. So failure modes happen, but remember this isn't a ridiculous case. Uh, there is a difference between a failure possibility and a failure ridiculous possibility. So just keep that in mind. Now, some other things that you have to look at, and I have a whole webinar on colorants that you can access. I'm just going to talk really quickly about it. It's one of the few things that we add to medical devices that are not, in some cases, is beneficial, like size determination and things like that. But for the most time, it just makes it look pretty. And making it look pretty really isn't a benefit to the patient. And so you're adding a material to the medical device that really isn't going to be a benefit. So you're looking at your benefit risk ratio, so it's not great. So I'm not saying, well, I am saying don't add colorants. <laughs> but if you're going to have to add a colorant because your marketing department tells you to, just know that there is additional assessments that have to go into. Um, and, and FDA did a web, Jennifer Good did a webinar on colorants. Uh, I did a webinar on colorants. So there's places you can go to to get some, some um, guidance on how to evaluate colorants. Okay, so that material chemical characterization is the first step in the biocompatibility process. It's the first thing you have to look at to evaluate your risk. And with that, it's just not you looking at those materials. It means you have to get a good relationship with your suppliers uh, because it's not just the review of your materials, but it's also the finished product, which means you have to look at what the suppliers put in as far as the processing goes. You have to look at what you put in as far as the processing, including sterilization and packaging. All of that goes into your risk assessment. And like I said, this involves communications with the suppliers, and we really like to have component com uh, uh, composition disclosures given to us because this is how toxicology works. It's about what it is and how much of it's there. And so if we don't really know what's there and how much of it's there, then our assessment becomes hard. Um, so that it makes it more difficult to, to pack our backpacks appropriately if we don't even know what we're dealing with. So when we talk with suppliers, these are some of the things that, well, when we, we work on a, um, or with a company to help them with their biological evaluation plans, these are some of the things we ask the companies to do. Uh, first off, put in manufacturing agreements. And this means if they change anything, and I mean anything, that they let you know. A quick example to this is we had a company, and some of you may have heard me say this example, but it's the perfect one for this. We had a company that got some raw materials from overseas and uh, to help put some controls, uh, process controls in place, they would run a cytotoxicity whenever they see, received a new lot. And they got like three or four lots a year, so it wasn't that burdensome of a thing to do. And for years, they got zeros, but all of a sudden, they started getting twos. And so they contacted the supplier, and they said, hey, we got zeros before, and now we're getting twos. What changed? And I can hear a lot of you probably say in your mind, the supplier would have said, nothing right so they went out to visit the supplier and when they were on site the, they had the little manufacturing cell that produced their material and it looked great it was clean and organized and um, they watched it for a little while and then the, the manager of the the cell came up and they said we take so much pride in our materials because we know they're used in medical devices uh, in fact we're continually uh, you know being careful and uh, we had uh, we had our people start wearing gloves to make sure they were cleaner and uh, they were latex powder gloves. So some of the latex was getting onto the material and causing uh, some reaction in the cytotox test. 
Now, first off, the reason I tell this is because this these this company didn't understand that this wasn't a process change or or manufacturing change. They just wore gloves. But they don't understand the personal impact of those two biocompatibility. So you need to make sure that they either know or let you know of any potential changes that can impact you. And with that, like I talked about before, composition disclosures. This is the best to get. Um, a lot of times it's hard, but that's what we ask for. Along with that, you want to know about the processing that they added, any age or residual chemicals that could have. It's because ultimately, you're responsible for those chemicals. And if you do chemistry, you want to know when you see something where it's coming from, either you or your supplier. MSDSs or SDSs is something you can always get, right? I mean, they, they, they are always available, but they're pretty much useless. I, I shouldn't say that. There are some that are better than others. Some of them have okay data, but they're by far the least useful thing we have up here. Um, and that's because sometimes they're not even correct. When we've been in deep with the MSDS trying to, to do some of these assessments, we found some just, just false data. So just be careful with MSDSs. Some of them are great, uh, some of them are not so much. You can also find companies that have device master files with the FDA or other regulatory authorities, and this, this is great. I mean, I, I use the example of silicone, New Seal silicones. I'm not uh, paid by New Seal, but uh, they have a lot of master files on uh, their silicones, and they even do some of those uh, testing for their master files uh, under sterilized products. So to give you an idea what a master file is, New Seal will look at how their device is being used in the marketplace. They'll do appropriate testing on um, processed devices as much as they can process themselves, including sterilization, and then they give that to the FDA. They file, they file for a master file with the FDA. The, master, the FDA looks at it, and then they give a master file. That means that number is for that material, and then the FDA has uh, looked over and said, yeah, this testing looks good for this, whatever this possible use could be. The concept is now if you're going to use new seal silicone, you could write new seal and say, hey, I want to use your master file because I'm going to use your silicone. And if New Seal agrees, they'll give you that master file. And great, now I have my material information. And you do. But you remember, your biological evaluation plan is not all about your materials. It's also about the processing. And even though they may have tested it under sterilization, does that sterilization meet your sterilization cycle? Or what are you doing to that silicone afterwards? Are you cleaning it? Are you whatever, whatever you're doing to the process? Does it change the biocompatibility of that that? New seal silicone. So it's just the first step is that material evaluation, and and you need to continue that. So I'm just going to. This is more for your information. These are the new directives. The reason I'm putting out here is because we talked about before. Where with the new MDR, it's such a big impact because just everything we just talked about, the material evaluation, the risk assessments, the BEPs, all that has to be done on all these new uh, new submissions to notified bodies even with devices that are currently on the market. So you can understand the big impact. Um, they're also changing classification, so that devices may be different classes than they were before. So all these are really impacting along the same time as these ISO 10.3 standards came out. Um, so, and then our, this is also a big one. Notified bodies are no longer contracting partners that allow for collaboration with the medical device industry, including enforcement tasking and sending authorities unannounced inspections. So they, they've been doing this for a little while, but they, they are no longer just uh, partners uh, that collaborate. They are more like FDA in some aspects. In fact, to be completely honest, we're seeing it a little bit more difficult to get through the notified bodies right now than the FDA itself. And that's a change. And I think it's because the notified bodies, remember, they're, a little unsure exactly what they're going to be held to under these new MDR. So they're, they're being a little bit more careful in their submissions evaluations. So just keep that in mind. Okay, so you've developed your plan and you've gotten feedback from your regulatory body. You do whatever testing and risk assessments that are needed. So that's whatever chemistry or biocompatibility or functionality, whatever testing you determine in your BEP, this is the second phase is when you do it. And then you walk into your third phase, which is that biological evaluation report. Now, this is an example of what a BER could look like. This is actually right out of the FDA guidance document. It's what they say is, is, is a possible approach to document the BER. Um, there's nothing wrong with this approach. Um, actually, the information in this is quite useful and, and it's something you should use when evaluating your BER. But you can do your BERs in any way. The, the concept of BER is, is 
what we talked about earlier, and this is the way that we use a BER. So if you look at it, you give the background of the whole purpose of why you do biocompatibility. Um, you give your device description and categorization again, because remember, that's one of the steps in your risk assessment is how the device is used. And then you go into your assessment itself, which is a re-evaluation of your BEP. So has the materials changed at all? Are you still using the same materials as you did in the BEP? Um, the processing the same thing? And then you talk about the biocompatibility test that you performed. So you're basically saying our risk from our BEP was this, um, and these are the tests we actually did. And then you know you can talk about particulates if you see particulates or chemistry if you did test the chemistry with the tox assessments any material change but in those biocompatibility tests you need to really give the fda the information they're looking for and that's where this chart comes in hand because this will actually give you some of the information that they're looking for for biocompatibility reports which is just not hey we passed right so if you just do a cytotox score zero pass that that's not really what the fda is looking for you either have to give them the report or in the BER, provide the information that's important for the FDA, like how the sample tested, um, what kind of extraction parameters were there, how long were the fluid on the cells. So you kind of have to know what the FDA reviews, but this in their guidance document kind of helps you give some ideas on that, and there's just some trial and error. But ultimately, this BER should give the FDA almost everything they need. We still uh, tell you, and they, FDA still re requires you to submit reports, but the hope is that this BER gives them a, a, a review uh, potential to look at the device story. And ultimately, this is what I call a BER, which is the device story, right? So you, you still have your risk in there from your BEP. You had your, plan, your testing, you, you said, and you basically tell the story how the testing went and what you did during the testing. And then ultimately, you conclude with something like this. This is based on the test results and the information summarized in this report. The device is biocompatible. It meets the requirements of, I need to update that, 293-2018-1-2018 uh, biological evaluation medical devices. And that person who's writing that BER needs to have sufficient background and education to be able to make that statement, specifically for notified bodies. So notified bodies will ask for the CV of that person writing this, and that CV better be sufficient enough to back up this statement, um, because ultimately this is your statement of safety. And uh, the person making that statement is going to be responsible to defend whatever differences may have an opinion from your regulatory bodies. So um, just keep that in mind. There's plenty of uh, firms out there that can help you write BERs. We, we are obviously one of those, but uh, the, if you don't have the, the sufficient education and experience, or if you just want an independent one, uh, there, there's ways to do that. Here's some other offerings that we can add because let's say when you're doing your testing or your part of your plan is to do some risk assessments. So let's the engineers love to change things and there's been many times that we've developed a plan, we've started testing and there's a material change. And even though that's unfortunate and hopefully that can be avoided, sometimes it can't and that's okay. We can write a biological risk assessment to evaluate the impact of that material change. And that material change has the impact of the material change goes back to toxicology, which is how much of that material is in that device that's changing and what the material is, um, because it's dose makes the poison. So if you're changing a very small component in the material in the whole device, um, and it's a well-known material, maybe the risk is a lot lower compared to if you're changing something like the whole device material, and then obviously if the device material is something you're not familiar with, and that becomes a higher risk. So they can help there, we can help there. If you do fail a test, obviously failure investigation is something you should, you should do. Most of the time, if you fail a test, it's gonna be the cytotoxicity test. That's the most sensitive test. And just because you fail a cytotox test doesn't mean that your device is unsafe. Uh, please keep that in mind. Um, there's definitely ways you can evaluate a failure and justify a failure because of certain endpoints that are not clinically relevant. Um, and then you got other changes like locations, processes, or specific requests from a regulatory body about a risk assessment. So these are things you can do, but based on all those, you, you would end up and uh, say that no further testing would be needed. We talked about gaps with a new MDR. There's a lot of reasons to do gaps. Um, even if you did an irritation test before 2010, uh, the irritation test changed from two rabbits to three rabbits in 2010. So there may be a gap analysis that need to be formed. Uh, so those offerings are also available. So to conclude, um, I, I mentioned that we're splitting the 1093-10 into two, uh, two standards, dash 23 and dash 10. 
and that, that part of that 23 would be in vitro alternatives. Um, we are also very close to having, um, so right now we can, we can run the in vitro test with a notified body, and we're getting hopefully closer. We are in the final steps of what's called an MDDT process with the in vitro for the FDA. So uh, just want to make you guys aware there will be future uh, webinars or discussions once that in vitro test becomes uh, more accepted through the FDA itself. Um, and then also give you some uh, other links to be able to have some information that may be helpful going forward. I want to thank everyone for their time they spent with me today. Um, I, I love talking about BioComp, so I'm hoping that you guys love listening to biocompatibility. If you do have specific questions on anything I talked today about or anything else about BioComp, here's my contact information. Please feel free to reach out, send me an email, give me a call. I'll be happy to help wherever is needed. Once again, thank you very much and have a wonderful day.